technical difficulties here and an echo. <laughs> uh, so today it is uh, a pleasure to introduce Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody to please log in to the uh, CME credit. Uh, it should be on the webpage you're currently viewing. Uh, that helps us keep track of uh, both attendance and also uh, generate CME credit. Uh, so, uh, so we would really appreciate it if you would take the time to fill that out. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brittany Annabal. Dr. Annabal joined us by way of originally University of New Hampshire for undergrad and then came all the way down to Pikeville for medical school, joined us for a pediatric residency here. Uh, she's then completing the circuit and returning to New Hampshire to practice general pediatrics. Uh, Dr. Annabal has a a uh, variety of presentations and research projects uh, throughout her residency. Uh, and today, I guess she's going to cap it off with a presentation on electronic media and children uh, for Grand Rounds today. So uh, please join me in a virtual welcome for Dr. Annabelle. Thanks, Dr. Dodd. Um, so like you said, I'm talking about electronic media and kids today. Um, thank you all for coming. There we go. There's my disclosure slide. I really don't have anything to disclose. And I did just want to put a personal disclosure in here. So this is my son when he was probably about a year and a half old. Um, he has his own tablet, as you can see in this. So I really wanted to research this topic, both from like a parent perspective and also from like a pediatrician perspective, um, just because I've heard all of the good, the bad, and the ugly. and um, I want to be able to give the most up-to-date information to all my parents. So um, we're obviously going to talk about the AAP guidelines for screen time. We're going to look at current trends of what kids are using and online and doing. We're going to get go over the common concerns that you probably have heard or will heard um, among parents and other pediatricians. And um, we're also going to go over VR specifically, virtual reality, because I've recently had a couple parents ask me about that and honestly I didn't know much about VR or the trends or even how it related to kids so we're going to kind of go over that and then finally look at the pediatrician's role in all of this. So this is a question I just wanted to start with. I was hoping to be able to use Zoom poll but we haven't really been able to get that to work so um, we'll just kind of talk about it. So first I'll read it and at the very end we'll go over the answer. So it's a nine-year-old boy, he's here for a well child check. He has a tablet that he uses for schoolwork and playing games. His mom's limited him to two hours a day, so go mom. She's concerned that her son's gaming will interfere with other healthy activities. He has a twin sister, but she doesn't really like games. And which of the following would you tell her and give her the most appropriate anticipatory guidance um, when you just have this discussion with her. So will you tell her he's at risk for an anxiety disorder, he's at risk for ADD, um, would you give her resources for a family media use plan, would you reassure her that two hours of time is great and that's safe, or would you um, screen the patient for a gaming disorder, gaming disorder using an in-office screening tool that you have. So keep that in the back of your mind and at the end of the presentation hopefully we can answer that. So I just wanted to start with some terms before we get into um, the different graphs and everything on media use. I did not realize these were kind of ubiquitous terms among the electronic media, electronic media research group. So a child usually is anyone zero to eight, a tween is nine to 12, and a teen is 13 to 18. Um, and a mobile device is actually anything that you can put in your hand and take with you. So smartphones, tablets, laptops, e-readers, all of those things can technically be considered mobile devices when you're looking at the research on this stuff. So probably whenever you talk about screen time with families or patients, the first thing that really comes to your mind is probably a picture like this. Because um, I think most people, from my experience, when I say screen time, they immediately assume TV. Um, but we really have to think about in this day and age, that's not really all screen time entails. It also includes things like this, and like this, and like this, and even this, and even this now. So 
whenever you say screen time, um, you really have to remember that's a very big umbrella term that includes lots of different things. And so parents, when you say screen time, may be thinking of one thing while you're thinking of something else. So, so like I said, let's start with the recommendations. So current recommendations are if you are 18 months old or under, you really shouldn't be doing anything except video chatting with grandma or your aunt far away or something like that. Once you're 18 to 24 months old, you still really shouldn't be having any screen time. But if parents do start introducing it, it should really be high quality programming that's very age specific and you definitely need to watch it with your parent or guardian. Once you're three to five years old, you can get up to an hour, but that needs to be very well planned. It still needs to be high quality programming um, and it still probably should be watched together and you shouldn't use this plan it to be like a calming time. Once you're six to 10 years old, you can get one to one and a half hours a day, but it needs to be very consistent, um, no more, no less. And then um, you need to make sure that you are planning this time where it's not gonna interfere with sleep or other physical activities or any other things that they should be doing, homework, things like that. Um, and then also once you're 11 to 13, it's not very much more, it's two hours per day but you really should be helping children learn how to like self-schedule and um, self-appoint this time on their own so that they can kind of make up their mind when's the best time to watch TV, when's not the best time to watch TV, and it still shouldn't really be interfering with sleep or homework or other physical activities or anything like that. Above 13 years of age, really, it still should be around two hours per day, but um, the AAP states that it should at that point, children should very much be able to self-schedule that time and should really be um, very good at deciding when is appropriate and when is not appropriate time to be using screen media. So with that being the guidelines, um, let's kind of move on to what do kids have access to and then we'll talk about um, the actual numbers of how much screen time kids are getting. So it's probably not a surprise that um, in kids zero to eight years old, 98% have access to a TV in their home. Um, but what's kind of high, kind of surprised me was 72% um, have access to the video streaming subscription services. Um, so there's a major trend right now in shifting towards that kind of from cable. Not as many children have access to cable anymore in their home. Um, in a bedroom, 29% of kids this age have an actual TV in their bedroom. And then 42% of parents state that the TV is on all or most of the time in their home. 91% have a laptop or desktop. 90% have access to internet, which is probably also not very surprising. Um, but the same amount of kids that have access to a TV have access to a mobile device. So we talked about that earlier, kind of what that includes. As far as video games, 69% have an actual console and 31% have just like a handheld, you know, can take with you video game type. And then 9% actually have access to virtual assistant devices. So those are your like Google Homes or your Alexas or anything like that that you can talk to and it talks back and helps you out. And then 11% um, have access to a VR headset, which also kind of surprised me. I thought it would be lower than that, but um, that's also kind of why I wanted to specifically touch on VR because it's a rapidly growing um, access that kids have to those. So this, looks, this graph looks at um, mobile device trends in kids from 2011 to 2017, and it's probably not surprising that access has skyrocketed. 95% um, have a smartphone in their home now, as opposed to just like um, about eight years ago, they had 31% had access. 78% um, have tablets in their home, and 42% of kids actually have their very own tablet. So this one looks at um, smartphone ownership, specifically among tweens and teens. Um, it's probably not very surprising either that 91% of 18 year olds have their own smartphone um, as of 2019 compared to 77% uh, in 2015. Um, the thing that you kind of, I was looking at and kind of realized on this graph was that 50%, um, so like half of the kids in 2015 didn't have a cell phone until they were 13, but now that's shifted to where um, at least half have their own cell phone by 11 years of age. So I don't think for myself, when I'm looking at an 11 year old, I don't really think much about going over like smartphone usage and good um, 
social media stewardship at that young of age, but it's probably something we should be thinking more about. So how are kids, so zero to eight, using all of this media that they have access to? So um, they kind of break it up from less than two to more than two because there is such a change um, from that age group. So if you'll look at, if you're less than two, the most recent research in 2017 was you spent 42 minutes per day with screen media, which you may look at that and you say, well, that's down from 2013. It was only, it was 58 minutes in 2013. So we must be doing better with this age group, but really it wasn't a statistical difference, um, like statistically significant difference. Um, and they also think that's big part in um, due to the decrease in DVD videotape usage and this kind of shift towards streaming services instead because it's harder for parents um, to continue to play videos on a streaming service than it was for them to put in a DVD and walk away and it's there playing for two hours. Um, and so that's kind of where that shift they think comes from. Um, but if you're more than two, um, you spend about two hours and 19 minutes per day and that's from the two to eight year old age range. Um, that time you can see there on the graph is kind of split almost evenly between TV and mobile device usage. And if you can see the actual time spent on a mobile device was about 48 minutes per day, which has been growing rapidly since 2011 when it was only about five minutes per day. So let's look at how adolescents use media. Um, so if you will look, the blue is your tween group and the purple is your teenage group and so if kind of look at the thing to look here is kind of the total screen time usage so there's a pretty big difference between tweens and teens um, most current research shows that tweens spend about four hours 44 minutes whereas teenagers spend seven hours and 22 minutes which you may look at that and think oh my goodness our 13 year olds are spending seven hours and 22 minutes in front of screens every day um, you also have to remember that uh, teens more than half of teens report um, media multitasking, which means that they may be browsing websites and also watching TV at the same time, or they're playing a game while um, also they have like music playing in the background through a streaming service or you know something like that. And so they've de divided that out here, but it may be at ha occurring at the same time, so it's a slightly less time. But that being said, it's also hard to say you know, how far off is that number? Um, it's probably not too far off, um, but they are spending quite a bit of time. So then we'll take a look at the kind of demographics behind media use. So the big thing is there is a very big difference between income um, and parental income and time spent with screen media use. So if you can look one hour and 50 minutes for your higher income bracket kids versus three hours and 29 minutes for your lower income bracket kids. And the hours for that, or the reasons for that, I'm sure are probably things that you've heard. It's um, parents that are lower income work, sometimes work more often and um, kids are spending more time unsupervised and different things like that. There's multi, multi reasons for it, but it's been a very consistent trend since they started doing these surveys back in 2011. Um, and if you'll also see the total screen time has gone up drastically for lower income uh, families versus the higher income families really have stayed pretty consistent um, with the same amount of time across the years that they've been doing these surveys. Um, they've also broken down screen time based on parent education, which there's also a um, pretty significant difference between high school um, degree parents versus college degree parents. Um, as far as race and ethnicity, there's not a huge difference. And gender, there was no statistical difference between uh, boys' amount of screen time versus girls' amount of screen time. So what are the main reasons that parents say that they allow media use for their kids? So 70% say because they need to just get chores done. 65% um, say to keep the child calm in public places. It's something they can do quietly and they'll sit there. 58% um, say to run errands, so they're using the mobile devices while they're running errands for their kids, and then 28% say actually to put the child to sleep. So this was a quote I found whenever I was doing my research that I 
thought was like very um, telling and really, you know, kind of stuck with me. And so um, should we really worry? We kind of know now the trends among media use. Should we worry about kids and digital media? Does it matter? Um, so this quote um, from Victor Strasberg, Strasberger in 2010, he said, the media are not the leading cause of any health problem in childhood or adolescence. However, they can make a substantial contribution to virtually every health concern that pediatricians and parents have about young people, aggression, sex, drugs, obesity, self-image, eating disorders, depression, and suicide, even learning disorders and academic achievement. So that kind of sums up kind of what we will talk about next. I always want to start with the good. So we'll start with the benefits of technology. So like I said, if you are less than 18 months, you can still video chat because keeping in touch with faraway relatives is very important for a kid's social emotional development. And a lot of even teens and tweens uh, report that as a common benefit of technology that they like. Um, it can also raise awareness and educate on current events and issues. Um, as we all know too well with the recent COVID, um, pretty much all of the information we're getting is through technology because people are social distancing. And then um, it can provide opportunities for community involvement. So if you know a, someone wants to raise money for an event or they want to host you know, an online fundraiser or they want to put together a community cleanup or something like that, you can advertise it on social media and then other people can come to it and you can get um, a more broad advertising range and hopefully more participants. You can enhance access to support groups, which we've also learned through this recent COVID outbreak. So, you know, even now you can, you know, go to a website and touch a button and get in touch with a therapist or a psychologist and get help. Um, and also you can get support groups through like social media, depending on what, you know, your circumstances, like it's easy to get in touch with people. Um, the big one though, that they also say, um, especially for adolescents that they have, you know, talked about is, um, like eating disorder support groups and things like that. And then inclusion of minority people. So um, especially in surveys that they've done on the LGBTQ community, um, they really feel like they get a lot of support through online social media and they feel more included um, through the use of online social media. And easy collaborations, we've also learned this recently. So students, instead of having to go over to student A's house, they can just form a Zoom group and um, all Zoom together and work on a project and share each other's screen and get things done quicker and easier than parents having to go and drop them off at someone's house and go pick them up and all that kind of stuff. So there are some benefits. Um, so this graph looks, um, they actually polled teens on how they feel social, me social media is affecting them. And if you look, almost half of them said it's neither positive nor negative. Um, they really didn't have one major feeling one way or the other. Of those that said it was mostly positive, they said the biggest thing, like I said before, was connecting family and friends. So being able to go on the internet and see people and talk to people and keep, keep in touch with faraway relatives. Um, among those that said it was mostly negative, the biggest reason they cite is bullying and rumor spreading. Um, so mostly it sounds like they're hinting to like cyberbullying, which we will talk on a little bit and a little bit later. Um, but overall, teens still feel like, most teens feel like it's kind of just part of life. It's not positive or negative. So we will do a quick recap of brain development that um, we kind of need to keep in the back of our mind as we're talking about some of the potential negative effects of media. So the biggest thing when you're thinking of media and screen time and things like that is the prefrontal cortex, so your executive function. Um, so your working memory is there. That's where you hold all your information that's not right in front of you, but you can still get to. Your impulse control, so filtering out distractions, but then also resisting temptations. And then your cognitive flexibility, so how can I think about this differently, change my approach, change my perspective to kind of still complete the same problem or task. Um, so all of these things are developing rapidly through the preschool years and early adolescence and don't even finish until your early adulthood, so your mid-20s. Um, also to keep in mind, by the age of five, kids can differentiate fantasy from reality. So this is real or this is not real. But then it's not till age seven or eight that kids have realism, which is the ability to say, to look at something and say, this couldn't happen in real life, or to look at something and say, oh, that could definitely happen in real life. And so that's something to definitely keep in mind as, we're talk as we talk about VR later, that really comes into play. 
So how about infants and toddlers? So children younger than two years old have to have hands-on time and social interaction to develop across globally, to develop cognitive, language, motor, and social emotional skills. There have been multiple studies done on this and they all kind of come to the same conclusion. What we have learned is that um, children, especially really younger than two, can't really transfer what they see on a screen into their real environment. So if you show them a crayon on a screen and they watch somebody drawing with a crayon and coloring with a crayon and scribbling, and then you give them a crayon in real life, they look at the crayon like they've never seen it because to them it's not the same thing at all. They're very different. Um, the one exception to all of this is really at 15 months of age. If you, for instance, we'll go back to the crayon. If you show them a crayon in digital media and the parents watch it with them and talk to them about it and then reteach at the same time with the crayon what they're seeing on the TV, then there will be some um, actual like ability to transfer that knowledge. But really, you have to do all of those things in order to get that transfer of knowledge. So um, if we need to watch media together, are we actually watching media together? So the quick answer is mostly yes. 84% um, of parents from zero to eight year olds say that they do watch TV with their kids most or some of the time. Only 15% say hardly ever or never. Um, but then as far as like gaming, um, that drops down quite a bit. And probably mostly because um, playing games and like especially video games is um, more common in the older children. So the parents kind of give them more independence with that. Um, but for overall, more than half the parents still say that they do play video games with their children. So now we'll kind of look at child development. We looked at infant toddler development. Now we'll look a little bit older kids. So around three years old, that's when your imagination starts to develop and your first friendships start to develop. And this is kind of when you'll start seeing kids come up with imaginary friends. Um, and then you kind of get this thing called a parasocial relationship. So this is when kids watch screens and then they kind of develop this one way attachment to a media character where this media character becomes like a really great friend and they feel like the media character is a real person and has the same basic needs that they do and really does all the same things that they do. Um, they see it as a true person and but this can actually be very helpful. It can support learning social behaviors and they did um, lots of studies on this um, through like common sense media. They, um, they discovered that through these relationships, kids were able to learn more kind of like empathy and sharing and things like that. But then at the same time, lots of studies have also shown that if you have excessive television viewing, that is gonna play a part in your cognitive language and social emotional development, it can cause delays. Um, a big thing that parents worry about is that screen time takes the place of more important activities that foster social interaction and that foster reading and active play. Um, some of the biggest risk factors for a poor outcome um, that in childhood for a poor outcome in adulthood is the earlier age of onset you start watching screens and the cumulative hours you watch screens as a child and then the amount of non-PBS content, content that you actually watch, which we will talk about content. So does it matter? So um, these pictures are pictures of um, apps that PBS has developed that they're currently using for research. Um, the biggest um, thing that we have discovered is that high quality programming and really high quality apps can improve cognitive literacy and social outcomes, especially in kids three to five years old, that they have the biggest benefit. And the major ones that have been studied have been Sesame Street and PBS Kids. Um, and so PBS Kids is doing research, like I said, with these apps. The Martha Speaks Dog Party one um, is for ages four to seven, and that's its goal was to study vocabulary in kids and can kids learn vocabulary from these apps. And then the other one was Super Y at the bottom, which is ages three to six, and they're trying to see if they can increase literacy skills in kids by using this app. And so what they found was they did pre and post testing, and they found that with the Martha Speaks Dog Party app, the biggest gains were in the five to seven year olds who scored 20% higher on post tests, but um, they did have a, um, a increase in scores kind of across the board. And then Super Y had gains across the board with all the ages except for seven year olds. Um, they didn't have as big of gains as 20%, but they still had gains. And then what they did find, though, is that uh, really most apps that parents use are not based on a curriculum. They're not 
developed by early childhood educators or um, developmental specialists. And so those um, have not been found to kind of give these same outcomes as the high quality ones. And then they've also done research on ebooks versus a hard copy book. And they've done research where parents have read an ebook to a child, and then they've also read the exact, then another group has read the exact same book in a hard copy fashion. And they found that the ebooks um, promoted less child parent interaction, and so there was less comprehension from the child when they did pre and post kind of um, studies on that. So one of the biggest, I think, risks that people think about when they think about TV use in kids is obesity, and it's also one of the most highly studied ones. Um, there is evidence to support that more TV use in childhood does predict if you're going to be overweight or obese in adulthood. And, but there's not a relationship at all that they have found between social media use and weight. Um, if you're, you're five times greater likelihood of being overweight if you watch more than five hours of TV per day as a child compared to zero to two hours a day. And they did a study of two-year-olds exclusively and compared their uh, amount of time with media consumed, not just TV, but total media. And they did find there was an increase in BMI for every single hour per week that they watched. Um, why, why is there this relationship between obesity and TV? The biggest reasons we think are because if you're sitting there watching TV, you're sedentary, you're not getting your physical activity. Um, but when they've done studies, the biggest risk factor they have actually found is eating, the high, cal eating high calorie foods while you're watching TV. Um, and not only that, you're getting advertisements for high quality foods while you're watching TV. And so it's, it's actually the food part of it more so than the sedentary part they found that plays a bigger role but it all kind of plays a role in this. Sleep is another one we think about. So if you have a screen in your bedroom, any sort of screen, not just a TV, you're gonna get fewer minutes per, fewer minutes of sleep. And that's across the board for kids of all ages and even babies. Um, it's the blue light we found from the screens that causes you have less melatonin. And then um, if you have less melatonin, you can't sleep as well. And they've also found that if you have stimulating content that you're watching right before bed, that um, activates the psychomotor part of your brain and that also keeps you up and so you don't sleep as well. Poor sleep is associated with poor academic performance. So if you're watching a lot of TV, getting poor sleep, you're more, less likely to do worse in school. And they even found, I've, I've had parents tell me before, they don't feel like infants are as, um, are as um, likely to have these effects, but they have found that infants that are exposed to screens before bed, they sleep less as well. So we kind of hinted on this before, um, cyberbullying. So this is one of the main negative effects that teens and tweens have said in surveys that they think it's the main reason screen time is negative. So um, extensive media use they have found does put kids at higher risk of being cyberbullied. And actually 10 to 40% of kids today say they have been cyberbullied. Um, how how is this different and is it worse or better? Um, I think you could argue it's kind of, it's in a way worse than regular bullying, face-to-face -face bullying, because the perpetrator can be totally anonymous, which means it's hard to stop it if you don't know who's causing it. Um, it can invade every aspect of the victim's life. So, you know, if you can get access to the internet, access to social media, then you have, then your bully can find you. So it can invade your home and all your other safe places. Um, it can occur any time of day. It doesn't just happen at school or at after school activities or anything like that. Um, as, like I said, as long as there's internet, they can find you. And then it can involve many witnesses. So they could post something about you. They could post a picture or something like that and um, share it. And then lots of people will see it. So it causes, um, it causes even more uh, negative feelings. It does lead to long-term and short-term social, academic, and even health consequences. So it is kind of, it is a big deal. And then how about other psychology parts of media? So they really don't know if there is a relationship between mood disorders and excessive use of social media. Those, um, but they do show like a strong correlation between them. Um, those they have found who follow uh, actual friends on social media are way, are less depressed than those who follow strangers. So when they say strangers, they mean more like celebrities or um, professional athletes, things like that, people you'll never meet. Um, and if you post your own material, as opposed to just looking at everyone else's material, material, they have found that you are happier. And there is lots of theories out there if media use 
will cause or exacerbate ADD or ADHD. Um, and studies show it may cause symptoms related to ADHD, but there's nothing out there that proves that excessive media causes ADHD. And then as we kind of talked about before, um, lots of teens are media multitasking, and they have found that when they do that, that negatively affects their attention and their focus. And in reports, they actually have found that more than half of teens report media multitasking during homework. And so that's definitely gonna play a, a role in your academic performance. Um, lots of studies uh, show that if you use excessive media, it puts you at higher risk for risky behaviors like alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and high-risk sexual practices. And actually, 9% um, of 10 to 17 year olds have experienced online solicitation. Um, and 10 to 12 percent um, have olds have actually sent or, or received a sex text. Um, and so I think a lot of parents think that that's kind of one of the things that can never happen to them. And I think they especially don't think it would happen to their 10 year old, um, but they have found it's occurring as young as 10. How about academic performance? The best study I found was JAMA actually did a meta-analysis in 2019 that just that was just released recently on screen use and academic performance. They looked at 58 studies that were from 1958 all the way to 2018, but they included 30 of those in their meta-analysis. And they found that really you have to look at um, the different types of media vary individually because TV is very different than gaming, which is very different than social media. And so really TV and video games were the most negatively associated with academic performance. Um, and they really found that TV played a big role in language in children and um, language development. Um, but overall, um, the time that was spent, so the total amount of time spent with screens was not really associated directly with academic performance. Um, they mostly did find though that TV and video games together had an inverse association and test scores though. So there's this other thing called problematic internet use and internet use and gaming disorder. So it is in DSM-5, but it's designated as a condition that needs more research. Um, it's not, a true um that is not a true diagnosis in the book um the symptoms of it are preoccupation with the activity so either internet use or gaming and you have decreased interest in your real life activities your real life relationships you can't really reduce your use um, you have major withdrawal symptoms whenever you reduce your use um, and this is actually prevalent in eight percent of eight to 18 year olds um, so close to one in so, I mean, really close to 10%. So um, the screening tools are available. If you suspect this in a patient, you can give them a screener in office. Um, and the top ones that they mentioned that I found were the internet addiction test, the um, Young of the Internet Addiction Questionnaire, the Chen Internet Addiction Scale, and then the internet is just a regular internet addiction scale. Um, and so those are all available to use and um, you can refer for this if find that it's an issue. And so like I said before, um, we are going to talk about virtual reality um, and kind of how that plays into kids. So like I said, I didn't know much about virtual reality. Um, and so I assumed that that would be something that would be worthwhile talking on. And so kind of overall, what is VR? And so it's whenever you you users' actions in the real physical world merge with a virtual world. And you can block out with the technology we have now, you can almost block out all the stimuli from the physical world. Um, and so tracking is how you kind of capture the movements in the real world. And then rendering is whenever they use these tracking movements in the virtual world. And then your display is kind of how you experience it. And so you have head mounted displays, which are the ones like seen in the picture here, but then they also have these things called caves, which are actual rooms that are lined with screens and you can make the entire room feel like this alternate reality. Um, and those um, are, not as, are not as easy to get as the head-mounted displays, obviously, because you have to go somewhere to do that, um, but they're still out there and available. Um, and currently, we're using VR for training purposes, for entertainment, for emotional and empathy training, um, and also for therapies, the biggest one being studied right now is PTSD, actually, in um, returning soldiers. 
So um, this graph over here shows what parents report um, as common kind of side effects from kids that use VR from eight to 17 years old. So the biggest thing is bumping into something. Um, and that could just be like bumping into the couch versus like bumping and falling down the stairs. It's a wide range, but 13% have experienced that. 11% get dizziness, 10% get headache, and 8% get eye strain. Um, we don't have a lot of research on kids in VR because it's such a new technology. Um, and mostly it's being studied in adults. Um, but from what we have, what we do know, we can assume that the effects are more intense and wide ranging for kids than what you would expect for adults. Um, VR, they have found from um, studies that they've done that it's interpreted more as a real life actual experience um, by the brain than just a media experience. And that's even more true for children. Um, kids and adults both require frequent breaks to prevent simulator sickness. Um, and so most of the um, companies now say like, you know, what is a frequent break? It should really be a 15 minute break for every 30 minutes that you're using the VR. Um, and as far as like eye strain, um, current studies really are mixed on, on how it affects kids vision. They have seen that there's short term and long term possible effects of vision on kids, but we don't really know um, much more than they could. Um, Playing games in VR, they have found in children, causes more aggressive feelings and behaviors than if you just play that video game in standard form. Um, and they have found that it can actually cause long-term aggressive feelings and behaviors, um, but we're, as far as like how long-term, we don't know. So this is a table um, that is a list of all the current VR devices for sale in the United States as of 2018. Um, and what I really wanted to point out here was the recommendation. And these are specifically from the manufacturer. Um, and most of them all say you need to be at least 12 or 13, mostly 13 to use. Um, and if you'll remember that kind of plays into the whole realism um, when you're able to discern realism. The bottom one, ViewMaster, they actually claim that they manufacture their device for children. Um, and, but even so, they say you need to be at least seven, and that's kind of when you develop realism. They found less than that. Um, there's more negative consequences for children less than seven that use it. And so I feel like this is very relevant to tell parents, um, because I've actually had a parent tell me before how young is too young, and I had no idea. Um, so this is kind of the starting point. So how do we guide parents appropriately, kind of knowing all of this? So um, this was also from Common Sense Media. Um, they actually asked parents, do you know the AAP guidelines? And 20% of parents um, said that they know the recommendations, but also 20% of parents say that pediatricians have spoken with them about the guidelines. So I would assume that if your pediatrician talks to you about it, they're actually knowing it, remembering it, which is good. But um, we're still only talking to about one in five parents about media use. Um, and if you look at the other chart, it says actually 51% of parents don't know them, but they want to know them. So um, that means that, you know, you can talk to parents more about it and they'll actually listen and they want to know, they want to know your recommendations and what you have to say about it. So what are the top kind of things we can do? So start talking about it early. So as we saw before, young kids are spending lots of time with media. Um, and lots of young kids have cell phones and access to lots of varying types of media. So don't assume that a child is too young to talk to a parent about it. Um, educate on the brain development. I think a lot of parents um, have heard lots of different theories and things, but they really want to know um, what is the science evidence behind it. And then also help families develop a family media use plan, which I'll show you here in a little bit. Um, that is a very useful tool put out by healthychildren.org. And then you can discuss high quality programming, how to find it, um, the top types of high quality programming, and especially in the younger kids, that that has a better outcome than using just other random games and things you can find. Um, always reiterate the importance of using media together. Um, a kid's never too old to use media together with their parents. 
and they really should have no screens during meals or one hour before bed. The biggest reason is for the sleep um, inter in to help make sure they're getting good sleep and that the screens aren't interrupting their sleep. And you should screen for problematic gaming or internet use when appropriate. Um, if you think you should screen, then just go ahead and screen. The worst is that it could be negative and you don't need to do anything else about it. Um, and then always ask kids about cyberbullying because as we saw before, um, as young as 10 year olds are being affected. And so I think a lot of parents assume that they don't need to worry about this until their kids are a lot older, but we found that's not really true. Um, and then always educate on the importance of social media stewardship because a lot of these kids have their own cell phone by the time they're 11. And so educating them on how to appropriately use the cell phone or at least educating their parents to let them know. And so like I said before, this is your this is the family family media use plan that is put on by healthykids.org, healthychildren.org, sorry. Um, and so if you click on if you go to the website and you literally just put in family media plan, it pops right up. And if you click on this one, um, the orange one, you can create a full family media plan, which you go through and it asks you lots of questions. You can um, develop a different plan for each child in the house, especially if you have a different age of child, um, like lots of different ages of children. Um, and then you can also create very specific things to your family, like if you um, go do something every Saturday that's specific, um, you can say we're not allowed to use screens during that very specific family activity um, and make it, and you can also um, help have the kids help and um, they can include things in there like this is how much time I spend on screens at school versus at home and different things like that. And then this one's the media time calculator, which we'll also go over in just a second, but you can do that for each individual child and, um, and develop exactly how much time they should be getting based on the other activities they do in their life. And so this is the media time calculator. I did it for my son just um, kind of to see. And um, it will start whenever you open it up for your child, you pick the age range of your child and it will automatically fill in um, how much sleep that child should be getting based on their age range. And um, then it will, the rest of the things will be um, zero and then it will be, the screen time will be a very big amount because it'll be whatever's left that's not that they're not sleeping. And then as you add in the activities that your child does and how long they do that, it subtracts from the screen time. So you're not changing screen time at all. You are getting a value for screen time based on how much time your kid would have left to watch screens after they do all these other things during the day. So my child's at daycare most of the day, so he really doesn't get much screen time. Um, and really that's about accurate. He gets about half an hour a day on an average weekday. Um, so we'll go back to that question. Um, so we have the nine-year-old, um, mom's worried about gaming. She limits it to two hours per day. Um, I don't know. Does anybody have any thoughts on what they think the answer is? Brave enough to shout out a letter. No. Okay. Well, we'll just start at the top. Huh? What'd you say? Well, looking at what amazing things you've taught us, <laughs> definitely should start with C, right? Have her to try and develop a family plan. Yeah, exactly. So that, that is the answer is C, um, because we don't have good evidence on if you are definitely going to develop an anxiety disorder. Um, and we also don't have evidence to support a causal relationship that he's going to develop ADD from his gaming habits. Um, the two hours of screen time, technically the AAP recommendations are one to one and a half hours of time for a nine-year-old, so that's a little high. Um, and then in this child, we don't have anything that supports the idea that um, he has a gaming disorder. Like mom hasn't talked about that, you know, the two hours a day is very um, hard for him and that he sneaks and plays games and that he can't limit it to two hours a day. Like we don't have any thought, any um, thing in the question stand that supports that. So I don't think we need to screen him for a gaming disorder just based on two hours per day of, of gaming. So yeah, the answer is C. Um, and so these are half my references and this is my other half. And this is my son doing something other than screens. 
So, <laughs> um, thank you guys. And does anyone have any questions? I don't know that it's a question, Brittany. I just have a comment. That was an amazing, amazing talk. Oh, I thank you. Learned so much, and really, I think it's very, very pertinent, especially in this time with COVID and the amount of time people are having to spend indoors. Um, that they're having probably much more access to their screens, their mobile devices, whatever. Not being, you know, at least in a school setting. Um, and then having to do a lot of the school on devices like that. And so sometimes it's hard for the parents to know, are they really doing some of their school stuff? You know, are they doing that? And then I love the media multitasking that you talked about, which I see my teenage son doing all the time and call him on it. I'm like, you know, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> I saw you looking at your phone, you know, put that phone away. I, I can, you can be on your computer tablet doing your schoolwork, but not on the phone. The good thing about the school computer tablet is it does not, it's not able to access the internet. It can do nothing except go to their school website and help him submit his work. Like that's, oh, that's good. Can do. So, but no, I think it was a wonderful talk, especially for this time. And thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you. Anyone have anything else? Hey, hey Brittany, I, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I know most of the negative research seems to be like towards more passive forms of uh, media consumption, but did you run across anything on like more creative uh, screen time? Like, uh, like a lot of the teenagers I see are into programming or graphic design or things like that uh, and, and seem very passionate about it. Uh, I was wondering if that, if you ran across anything showing that sort of activity may be harmful. Um, no, the only thing, like I did find a lot of times they, in the research I've found, like they always said they excluded programming, like in as um, like total time kind of for the negative, the negative consequences research, like, um, but as far as like how it affects it, I, I didn't really find anything. I just know a lot of times they exclude that kind of stuff as far as like how much total time kids are spending and kind of include more of like pure entertainment type screen time. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, I like the part where you talked about like, you know, for kids with depression and anxiety. And I think it really definitely is a field that has to be researched a whole bunch more because it seems that there's some positive effects of screen time for kids like that, but then maybe lots of other negative effects too. So really trying to piece out which part of it may be good for them and, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to end bullying on the internet may, may be a very big part of what we have to do as future pediatricians. Yeah, I um, basically like I looked through the DSM for all these different things and they basically just say for everything like more research is needed, more research is needed. So I agree with that. I really think it kind of needs to be a focus coming up, especially if we continue to do much more electronic stuff if people continue to try to social distance for a long more a lot more time. It'd be interesting to see if we see a rise in depression along the same time. I think the positive pieces of um, technology and screens um, can't be underscored at a time like this also where people have been able to connect with family or to you know do things that would not have otherwise been possible in a time when we didn't have such easy connectivity or screens to be able to do it. Um, you can connect with people all across the world and families. And so I think that is um, that is one positive piece of screen time. Yeah, and I've been looking to see what the different, um, different organizations kind of say about screen time during COVID. Um, so I was just very curious. And it seems like a lot of people kind of have some differing opinions. Like the AAP has stayed, they still believe in their they still think they're 
amount of screen time should be followed and things like that. And you just may have to redevelop your family media plan, but then other play, other organizations, um, like, um, like, um, American sociology, I think on and child development and websites, things like that, they've said like, you know, it's a very personal thing during this time. And it's hard to say if you should use more screen time or not. And, um, so it's been, kind of a mixed bag on what people think you should do during this time. Hey, this is Dave. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It was such an important area and I think I learned a lot and I think we all have a lot to learn. It is interesting during this time what happened when they closed schools so that, uh, you know, screen time had to go up because a lot of the schools were assigning, uh, doing assignments based on uh, Google Classroom or Canvas or other things and so I think these I think it's I love your and I, I think it's a very important thing to have a family uh, media plan and something in adolescent clinic we need to start doing regularly all the other things but it is uh, really a very positive way to help structure and it does need to be flexible like these kinds of times uh, you know the screen time had to go up I have seen in clinic, and, I, and I'm sure others seeing adolescents would say the same thing, that their schoolwork really did, their school time, their schoolwork really did go down. Even the schools like Science Hill and others that kept kids pretty well engaged. Uh, and and I, the use of social media or gaming in particular seems to have gone way, way up. So it's it, I think it has been a, there's a lot of positives about it, I think, especially for kids that are, uh, for some kids, uh, kids that are struggling with anxiety and depression, and sometimes it's a very important connection to friends, but I think uh, on the whole, during this COVID time, I've seen gaming go way up, mm -hmm. and it, it's disrupting sleep, it's doing lots of bad stuff. So I, I think encouraging parents to stay engaged, to really know what their kids... The other thing I'll mention, too, is just it's really unfortunate that the most popular games for males are very violent mm -hmm. um, first person shooter games that are just uh, well Grand Theft Auto is not a first person shooter but all the other ones they're just really quite violent and it's and Grand Theft Auto is very violent so I think trying to screen the content of those games is very important for families but I don't I haven't rarely do I know a parent that knows the content of those games so but really great talk. Thank you so much for important information. Yeah, thank you. Well, if nobody else has any other questions, thank you once again, Brittany. We are very sorry that we're losing you to Plymouth Pediatrics and <laughs> <laughs> Adolescent Care. Uh, we wish we could have held on to you right here in East Tennessee since you moved south, but do come and visit us often as you graduate. I know we're a week, 10 days away from graduation for all of you seniors, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We'll see, maybe I'll get tired of the snow and have to come back down south, who knows. <laughs> all right, thank you all. Thank you.